Hi, this is Sally Morgan, physical therapist, craniosacral therapist, and Tellington T Touch practitioner for animals and people. This is Tristan. He's a corgi. Hi, Joyce. And I am sure people across the west and north are already in the throes of this storm that is coming here tonight. We're all just sitting here admiring the ground that we can see <laughs> and waiting for first the storm and then the you know high of two on Monday which in lots of parts of the world doesn't seem that cold, but for us, that's really cold. So uh, also other news, Brian has uploaded all nice 12 at Danny's house this morning. See, I'll feel like it's hot when it's two degrees compared to you. <laughs> Brian has uploaded all of the conversations with the Corgi until uh, a couple days ago onto YouTube. So if you have friends that are watching them there, you can tell them the next 10 or 12 are already there. And, um, Today I want to talk a little bit about these animals I went to see on Thursday. Sorry we're late getting started today. I'm the vice president of the SPCA for my town, Northampton, and we are having a change of presidents and treasurers, which means the organization may fold because without those offices you cannot run it. And so I got a phone call um, in regards to that right when it was 9.30, so here we are. Um, so I went off to Rhinebeck, New York to see these horses. I used to live out in that area, so I was very familiar with the towns and the horse farms in the area. This was at a farm that, of course, since I haven't lived there for 25 years, <laughs> was uh, newer or had been converted into a nice horse farm in those years, not prior. Um, and so I had a really interesting horse that I think would be um, fun for people. Well, I don't know, interesting to hear about. So his name is Amadeo, and he is uh, an Andalusian, I believe, and a big bay horse. Um, and he was used in uh, exhibitions and performances, um, not so much for competition and certainly not so much for trail riding. And he's very handsome, and he's in his 20s. Well, his person was taking him up to the ring, which is quite a bit of a walk from the barn to the ring for a horse. I mean, it's probably a quarter of a mile. It's, it seems pretty far. Uh, over some icy patches, etc. Um, although I think this happened in the fall, so unless it was during that snowstorm in November, it wasn't so bad outside. And he walked into the ring and loves Tristan's scarves. No, I don't knit them and I buy them at one of those places in town that is um, crafts from around the world, 10,000 Villages, I think it's called, and they're like 10 bucks. And they were mine, but uh, when I had short hair, so. Now they're his. <laughs> um, and I have about 20 in purple and blue, every shade. <laughs> so anyway, um, this horse entered the ring and somebody was lunging a horse there, which if you don't know what that is, he's trotting in circles on a long rope and that rope broke. And the two horses, some that the loose one came up to the other one and there was rearing and pawing as you see often with horses. And the person um, that I know was trying to get off and was having a hard time because her horse was leaping and plunging. And when they first meet, they paw and he struck up and got his hoof caught in his leg uh, in between the reins. And so he was pulling on the curb rein of the bridle and then somehow got his other hoof through and then they fell on the ground in a tangle of their two bridles and their legs. And she said that when eventually she was able to calmly look at the bridle, the parts of the curb bit, which is a long bit out of the horse's mouth, were just split aside like this because of all the struggling going on. And it was really difficult to untangle the horses. There were two people and they were thrashing and pulling their heads around. And, you know, it was really a terrible accident. <clears throat> and, uh, so the horse that I was working on, it had his head pulled way down to the side for several, you know, like 10, 20 minutes while they finally were able to get one strap undone on one bridle and start to free things up. So that happened in about mid-November. So I'm seeing the horse now basically eight weeks later. And it was so interesting working with him. He gets a lot of body work from his person. 
and he just as they say really soaked it up like he just stood quietly as soon as I put my hand on his sacrum he was really responsive he dropped his head he quietly went to sleep and uh, you know I was able to work through his body he had an interesting situation going on most animals and people end up with like a zigzag of dysfunction so you have like a right shoulder problem and a left hip problem or and then a right knee problem or something like that <clears throat> occasionally maybe a third of the time you get this other kind of problem where it's right side right side right side so that's what had happened to this horse everything on him uh, was curled to the right and with the work I do I can tell how old some of those restrictions are so my guess was that he was curled to the right in utero as well because some of those restrictions in his fascia were very old you know 20 years old so um, interestingly when he fell onto the ground and curled up he went into what we say in my work is the direction of ease, which is curled to the right as he was in utero. And so I worked my way up through his body and it was so interesting working on his face and head because there's a little muscle, I'll show you on the corgi, well, a group of muscles right in this area between the jaw and the temporal bone and also towards the middle of the face here. And boy, they were just in such a spasm and I didn't notice initially looking at him whether his eyes were crooked because sometimes when you look straight on you can see that the head is tilted up but certainly his ears weren't straight and oh my god the amount of heat pouring out of that spot and you know he just stood there quietly in a really deep sleep going <sighs> as it was all releasing 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 and you know we're on a time frame here because people had places to go and i had to drive home so i was trying to do an hour session with each animal or person i was seeing but you know i was in such a deep place working with this horse that our session spilled over like another half hour and i bet we were working on just those muscles around the jaw for a good 15 minutes and then of course we did a lot of releasing on the whole side of his face all down through his muzzle and his upper and lower teeth and you know, she hadn't been able to really check his teeth to see if any had been broken in this process. Um, and, you know, he's eating normally and the vet said, oh, he's fine. And he has old suspensory injuries behind. And he had a ton of stuff going on in his right hip, which I think is probably from compensating from those suspensory injuries. Um, one of the things I've noticed myself as I'm an older person now is that you, you need to warm up. You cannot just like when I even I'm inside, it's not even cold out. I'm throwing a toy with Tristan. If I twist my hand just a little bit the wrong way and like struggle to get it from him, even a tiny bit, I mean, he weighs 18 pounds. How much of a struggle is that? I sprain my wrist repeatedly. <laughs> and when I was younger, that would never have happened. So this poor horse, you know, like so many horses, you know, you just don't know how much you need to warm them up. So at some point earlier in his life, um, he had some suspensory problems going on. So his hips have been working really hard. Um, his stifles were in pretty good shape, which is equivalent to our human knees, which often are not in good shape um, on a, a horse like him. But I worked all through his head and his muzzle, and when we were done, he was just standing there with his head down, just exhausted almost, but in a really deep place, sleeping. <laughs> and he has a back-on-track blanket, which is a great thing because they're like they reflect the heat from the horse back into the horse, so they'll keep him really warm and it also helps relax the muscles. It's a great thing for an older animal, um, and they make blankets for dogs and beds for dogs and blankets for horses. And, you know, if you're ever um, at a clinic or something and you're cold and somebody's got a back on track blanket, you'll see four people sitting under it because they are so wonderful. So we turned him out. I really wanted him to go back in his stall so he could really rest, but um, he has limited turnout there, and so he really wanted to go out because he doesn't get out for too many uh, hours a day so he went out and he was just a happy pony after that his gait was really different you know you could really see the way he was carrying himself was different it was really a profound change and uh, the owner of course was so appreciative and I said to her this is where the story's going you know if you had had anyone else come to do this they if you don't know what I know which is a lot about craniosacral therapy for horses you wouldn't have been able to have the skills to release all this restriction around his ears. His temporal bones weren't in sync. Basically, there are bones under your ears and they go like this. And with his head being pulled and jarred, his were doing something like this, only they weren't going forward at all. And to correct that, you have to 
have really sensitive touch and you have to be really familiar with how that's supposed to be moving. And I said, thank God we know each other because I don't, you couldn't have found somebody else except my friend Tracy in Colorado to come and, and take care of this. And this was something that was really impacting this horse's quality of life, let alone his ability to be ridden. So um, this is a plea out to anyone listening to this to please express an interest in taking a craniosacral class for horses or dogs on my website because Tracy and I both teach this work and we would love to come <laughs> to wherever you are. You know, I think either of us only need like four to six people to make it worth the trip, which isn't that many. And we need a, you know, a nice place to work um, in a barn and we need a, a nice comfortable place for people to learn. Like the lady at this barn said, I'll host classes, but there's no place for the students to sit and write and look at PowerPoints and skulls and things. And she said, well, what about the indoor? And I said, well, think about it. Can you learn at your best in a dusty indoor, especially if there's distracting other riders in there that are doing things that you A, find interesting or B, are not happy with? No, you can't learn in that situation. So it's really difficult um, to do it in an indoor ring. But, you know, lots of the nicer farms, and certainly there's been many I've been in on the East Coast um, that have a big kind of heated viewing room or, you know, the farm I had my horse at for a while, the tack room was huge. And so even being in there, um, it would have been hard to project on the walls because they were covered with bi uh, bridles and saddle racks and things. Um, but lots of nicer farms have a viewing room. And certainly for the dog class, all we need is a living room in somebody's house um, and some dogs to work on and some cats and bunnies available. So if you have any interest at all in learning this work, um, please think about hosting a class because uh, you know these animals need this work so desperately. And I'm 60, how many years? I mean, maybe 15 years I can teach this stuff and travel a lot. I need young people to learn how to do this work to help these animals. It's just really imperative that we get this word out there because um, so few people do what I do. I was able to talk to um, uh, one of the first uh, alternative medicine vets in our country, Dr. Alan Schoen, last night for the radio show. And he had a really interesting story about the history of acupuncture and its growing use in the field of veterinary medicine. And, he kept saying, well, I heard about this great class for humans. And I said, hi, I'm a doctor of veterinary medicine. Can I come? And they said, sure. <laughs> and so a few times he was able to learn things um, for humans and then apply it to pets, which is quite a lot of thinking outside of the box, because even though our anatomy is similar, um, it takes a lot of study, I'll tell you, because I've had to do this, to know the subtle differences, especially in the bones of the skull of the dog or the horse or the cat or the bunny or the human. Um, and, and then to be able to feel how those move in craniosacral therapy is a real skill. So for him, he was looking at where the acupuncture meridians might go, what the pulses might feel like, what diseases in dogs might be similar to a disease in a human and what that might disrupt the flow in the meridians. So it's all a process of learning, but I am happy to come and teach classes in your areas. And I am really hoping to do a class at Monkey's House in New Jersey, near the airport actually in Newark, um, to teach the dog and cat work sometime this spring, because I do think I've got a group of people in that area now who are really interested in taking the class. So stay warm. Tomorrow we're going to talk about the weather, because how can we not? The Weather Channel disappointed me by talking about the rain in the south. And, you know, as Joyce pointed out, she snowed in. Like, let's talk about that. <laughs> That's serious. That's not just rain. <laughs> rain doesn't flood for a couple of days. All right. So I will see you guys tomorrow, hopefully around 930. And I won't be getting a phone call. And I will not be leaving the house, certainly, because we are supposed to have a foot of snow overnight turning to severe ice. Thanks for joining us today. Bisky. Danny has seven inches of snow, but the cold is really, un yeah. I'm concerned about the cold. If we get power outages in the Northeast, it's not gonna be pretty. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Everybody have a great day and stay warm.